It may not appear this way to many of you gathered here in our assembly this morning, but I must confess, if you all indulge me for a moment, that the last four weeks have been like a roller coaster ride, at least for me. For just four weeks ago, I stood here in this pulpit and preached a sermon on Jesus calling his first disciples along the shoreline of Galilee. A little over 24 hours after that moment, I received a call from our district superintendent informing me that our bishop and the cabinet, following a time of prayerful reflection and discernment, has decided to appoint me to a new charge. Following a week of prayer, discernment, and conversations that I had with those trusted people in my life, the appointment was announced here as well as at Lovely Lane, where I will begin to serve as their lead pastor in July. That same Sunday, I preached at Eden Wall, and to my surprise, the news about my appointment traveled faster from here to Grace than I traveled to Grace. <laughs> Word travels fast around here. And now standing here before you, beloved, I must confess that the feeling of being on a roller coaster ride still remains. Don't get me wrong, Robert. I love roller coaster rides. I love the thrill of them. I love the excitement. But as I shared with this congregation on the Sunday when the announcement was made before here at Grace that I would be assuming a new charge in July, I simply want to remind each and every one of us still that there is much work to be done here at Grace. There's a whole lot of runway left before y'all say goodbye to me. So I just hope that you all are ready to ride with me. For we have Gospel Sunday service next Sunday. A little bit of the announcement reminding you again. Ten days from today, we have our Ash Wednesday service. And we'll begin our journey through Lent during that season. Following today's service, our mission and outreach committee will begin the work of planning for our, our day of service. Very important time in the life of grace. We have two discipleship reading services, one that Reverend McCullough is leading and one that I'm leading in Lent. We have Vacation Bible School that is in the process of planning. We're planning for a pilgrimage to go down to Alabama to visit some of the historical sites as a part of our work in the beloved community group. And yes, we are planning, prayerfully planning a mission trip. And not to mention working with our young people with an aim to confirm close to 12, maybe 13 confirmants in the body of Christ. Each of these examples represent the activities and the vitality and life that is Grace United Methodist Church. There are many other examples, though, that I could share with you standing here this morning, but for the sake of time, I won't. Let me simply say this or offer this as our last comment on the matter. If you are among the people who have not yet found your ministry here at Grace, I invite you to consider one of these opportunities that were named. The question isn't whether there are activities available for you here at this church. Rather, the question is, are you available to be vessels by which God will bring about God's increase here in this branch of Zion? The scriptures have been read, and I just want to celebrate Christian and Ashley for sharing in our worship on this morning. Again, another opportunity. And for the remainder of our time together, I just want to lift up the words that were shared by the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth. In the third chapter, beginning around verse 5, we find these words written. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants to whom you believed, as the Lord assigned each. I, being Paul, planted, 
Apollos watered, but God gave forth the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Here in the context of this passage, beloved, Paul is addressing what was a division in the Corinth church that had emerged since he had planted the church and as the church continued to grow. For some members of the body had expressed allegiance to Paul, while others had expressed allegiance to Apollos. Such expressions of allegiance to one form or style of leadership, be it their preaching, maybe their teaching, frankly isn't limited to that first century church. For even today, in our contemporary society, there are many members of the body who have not openly, privately expressed their preference for a particular style or ministry or leadership. I recently read a post that caught my attention that was shared by a colleague where the writer compared the activities of two local congregations. In one ministry context, the activities were to the person's liking or personal preference, while at the other church, the writer criticized the activities, suggesting that the latter church had departed from some of the traditions and customs that the writer once celebrated. Both churches, get this, preached the same gospel, preached out of the same Bible. However, their styles and their customs were unique to their settings. Here is an example, beloved, of the kind of tension that oftentimes occurs in our churches. Not here at Grace. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but these are the kind of tensions that we hear about, we see, and if we're really honest with ourselves, may even be guilty of at one point or another. When the focus lies more on the activities themselves rather than the opportunity, and might I add, privilege to bring souls to Christ, Make no mistake about it, each time that I stand here before you, I recognize my place. It is not to showcase me. It is not to showcase what we do. It is to celebrate the living God, the resurrected Savior, and to bring others to that knowledge and that confession of faith. And here in this text, Paul is unpacking the tension in the Corinthian church a tension which at its root is evidence of spiritual immaturity in the body. Paul said, I could not speak to you from a spiritual perspective, beginning this text. Instead, I had to address you from the flesh as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are not ready, says the apostle, for you are still in the flesh. And for as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not in the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? This tension that Paul addresses in the Corinthian church is a tension that the church still faces today. For there are many in the body that continue to operate with the human inclinations as opposed to the spiritual. For if we're honest with ourselves, the moment we find ourselves critiquing either preaching styles or liturgical styles or the dress of our fellow parishioners and a host of things that we talk about in small circles and private settings, we expose to our neighbors, to our brothers, to our sisters, to the world, 
the level of spiritual maturity or the lack thereof that we have within the body of Christ. Paul's response to this tension, this division within the church is summarized in his statement beginning at verse 5. What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Who is Laban? Who is Reverend McCullough? But servants, servants through whom you came to believe, has the Lord assigned each of us. Paul recognized his role in the gospel ministry of Jesus Christ, like that of his co-laborer, Apollos. Their role was simple. They were both servants of Jesus Christ. And what's more important for each of us as professing believers of Jesus Christ is that our primary duty, our purpose in the body is to serve. Jesus in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 says it this way, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a servant to all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Beloved, just as Jesus came to serve, each of us, you and I, are called to serve one another. Some are responsible for great tasks, while others may be responsible for smaller tasks. The size, the scale, and the scope are not what matters. What matters most is our faithful participation in the work that God has assigned for each of us. That's what matters. As Paul says, I planted. Apollos watered. But it's God that brings about the increase. So neither the two who planted or watered is anything, but only God who gives about the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, says the apostle, and each will receive his wages according to their labor. For we are all God's fellow workers. You and I are God's field and God's building. And it is this mysterious interworking of our service and activity by God, God's spirit and our efforts that result in amazing increase. One writer suggested this way, the greatest blessing are the work of God's hands and not the result of our labor. It's God's hands that are at work that matters. It is through God's hands that we see increase wherever we may see increase, lest we boast in who we are. When I was a preteen, I remember my grandmother and I, we planted a vegetable garden in our backyard. It took us several weeks, I remember, to prepare the ground, to remove the rocks, to clear the soil so that it was fresh and fertile, ready for the seeds that we planted. We planted seeds, everything from corn to cabbage to cucumbers, snap peas. I feel like I said this before, but. And then we watered the ground. And then we waited. We cared for the ground. We attended to it every now and again. But what took place beneath the soil 
and the combination of the rain and the sun's influence on that land resulted in the growing process that neither my grandmother or I could take credit for. Come harvest time, we celebrated the abundance of the produce that came out of that planted garden. But we could not take credit for what came from that garden. For the greatest blessing, beloved, that came from that garden was not from our labor. Though we'd worked our better parts off. Amen. Amen. It was God and God alone that brought forth the increase. I'm sure that the Lord will send another servant here to grace. In fact, I'm almost certain that in a couple of weeks we'll be making that announcement with God's help. But it will not be the work of any of us to influence that process, though it may help. It will be the work of God's hands that will provide the increase for this next season. And for that, we can praise God, truly praise God, from whom all of our blessings truly flow. Amen.